who's your emergency contact? Who should we notify in the case of death? Welcome to the USP, where I've spent the last two plus decades of my life. I got to Florence in 2017, but as I've told you in prior videos, I ended up getting jumped in the kitchen because, you know, half them dudes that was on the yard was hot. And they knew I was going to plot on them after I got my visit from my wife, so they jumped on me. And I went to the shoe in April. It didn't get back out to about October of 2017. But when I came back into the unit, that a dude that I fought with, uh, his name is Boo Man. He's a GD that I was in Atwater and he was in Lewisburg with me. When I first got there, he was across the cell from me that witnessed my cell he spazzing out on Tucci and I ended up being in the dry cell for, um, you know, for three days. But when I came back out of the shoe in Florence, he showed me a news article that had reported that, um, an inmate had escaped from Atwater. You know, I, was, I wasn't there, so I don't know all the details about how he was able to escape from Atwater, but to his credit, that's a hell of a feat. You know, they say they climbed, he climbed over the first wall when you're going towards a chow hall. When you're on the west side, when you go into chow hall, there's a big ass gate where they bring in the trucks and stuff where when they have to do maintenance work on the yard. So I guess when he was during chow time, a couple of people seen him climbing the wall, but nobody say anything. But if, as far as his story goes, I think he got caught within like a week or two later. Like he didn't really have a plan beyond getting over the wall. Now, because of that escape, at the time in Atwater, when I left, they had Matavosin. And this dude's a cold-blooded bitch, right? And now, and I don't know, in the correctional facilities, as far as like being staff, being employed or whatever, you know, the bigger the asshole, the faster they move up the ranks. He became an assistant warden in Victorville. He tried to put a manifesto on how to bring the prison population to his knees and how to break their spirit. Well, the people ran out, ran him, ran him out of Victorville, and he ended up being out in Atwater, being a warden in Atwater, and he fucked that whole yard up as soon as he got there. He didn't really like it that every time he came on the yard doing his little rounds with his uh, stooges, that I was on the compound running a dice game, that I was on the compound having a spray with my homies. So, you know, me and him kind of went in, like we had a little little beef, but of course I can never win because I'm an inmate, I'm a prisoner. He ended up chopping off the tables, just fucked the whole yard up, splitting the yard and the rest. Well, after this dude escaped from his facility that he was in charge of, he got in his mind to take the area that the sweat lodge for the Native American away from them. You know, the sweat lodge was in between education and 3A. There's like a little space between the unit and that building that the Native Americans and the oldest and other religious people have their little shrines and stuff. But the Native American had their sweat lodge over there. And we were in Atwater. We had a really good rapport with the Native Americans. And once a month, we'd all go and sweat with them. But you know, we have one fire that's burning up, that's burning the rocks that's gonna be used for the sweat. Then we had a little fire on the side that we would use to cook the food that we brought over to the sweat lodge. You know, we always look forward to that. To us, it was like a day out in the lake minus the lake. You know, we are just out there hanging out and bonding with the people around you, the people that you might be relying on to save your life in a jam. You know, things that we do as far as like having you know, homie days on Friday, having spreads and coming together in sweat lodge. It's all to build rapport and relationship to get everybody an opportunity to get to know each other. Because, you know, some people have their programs where they're in education or they're at the facility working all day and don't ever get a chance to interact with the rest of the homies on the compound. So we set aside a day once a week, once a month for everybody to come out 
and just enjoy themselves and bond. Well, they took the yard, they took the, um, the sweat lodge area from the natives and moved it into yard three. They fenced it up in yard three and made a little sweat lodge for them. Well, this incident that I'm about to speak on was relayed to me by my homeboy, uh, Kay. He's a Laos dude from New Jersey. He became my sailor when we was out in Florence. And he was telling us about, you know, what I just mentioned. And on this particular day, you know, the natives were complaining about how the setup is, you know, things that they need to, to worship, to go through their ceremonies. And the CEO in question at the time, you know, he was an ass. He was like, man, stop being a, you know, stop, stop bitching about it. But you know, I emphasize in a penitentiary, there's certain words that you can consider trigger words. You know, if I call somebody outside their name, if I call them a lame, a bitch, a punk, I'm telling this dude, I'm trying to see you, homie, because I'm using this language to make sure that you can't forgive me for it. If I call you a bitch, according to the mentality that we are in a penitentiary, you're not gonna be able to let it go. And if you are, your homeboy is not gonna be able to let it go. Your homeboy is not gonna allow somebody to call you a bitch without you going over there handling it. Because if you allow someone to disrespect you by calling you a bitch, a punk, a lame, and whatever other else words that you can use to, you know, be demeaning and derogatory towards someone, if someone disrespects you in that manner and you don't do nothing about it, your homeboy is gonna handle you. Because to us, the way it looks like, well, if you ain't a bitch, you should have broke that dude's jaw. But since you didn't, then you must be a bitch. And if you's a bitch, we don't want you around. You know, these words that we use, you can't overlook them. You know, it's just the way that our system, our mentality is set up. So when a CEO tells the native, stop bitching about it because of the issues they had with their sweat lodge and how it was arranged or whatever, you know, the bros took it as being disrespect as the CEO is calling them a bitch. So they applied on the CEO. So, you know, I, I'm no longer on that yard. So I can't really speak to the politics that transpired between the homies and the Native Americans at that time. But the Natives went and let everybody on the compound know that they're gonna hit this CO. And to the credit of the population in Atwater, nobody told the CO, nobody told on them that it was gonna happen. So they had a week to plan for the lockdown because you know, when a CO gets hit, when a CO gets stabbed, when a CO gets assaulted, you're getting locked down. And depending on the severity of what happens determines the duration that you're gonna be locked down. So we had a homie over there, uh, we call him Bow Wow, Vietnamese dude, I think from Northern California. Now he was in there for, you know, some cute computer chip robberies back in the 90s. Got a life sentence. But he had worked in commissary. And a couple other homies that worked in commissary went and bought garbage bags full of soups and stuff and was helping looking out for some of the homies that might not have the money to withstand a lockdown. And every race was doing that. The Serenos, you know, the Paisas, the Blacks, the Whites, everybody that knew that the incident was gonna go down was prepping themselves for the lockdown because they know, you know, with us, when somebody says, I mean, and we're talking about people that's credible. We're not just talking about anybody that's just speaking out of their ass just because they're mad or upset at a time. But when you're planning to hit a CO, it's something serious. You can just get locked down just by someone telling you that you said this or you're applying it. So, you know, the community in Atwater took the native bro serious that this hit was gonna go down. So the whole yard prepared themselves for a lockdown. They went and stocked up their locker, got whatever else they needed. Well, on this day when it came, the bros did their thing. Four or five of them 
out there on the yard. I think it was the week when they were going back to sweat. They went and stabbed up dude. You know, from my homeboy's perspective, the homie K that was telling me, they looked like the natives were all over dude, stabbing him up, you know? Like everybody that seen the incident would have swore that dude was gonna be a body. Anyway, the deuces come, deuces get hit, the CEOs run over there, they contain the situation. Well, now the whole prison is on lockdown. And while the prison is on lockdown, I think just the next day or a couple of days later, they seen that CO in question, the one that's supposed to been got stabbed up, came to work. So like whatever they were doing to him, they didn't really punish him because the motherfucker was back to work the next day. But now the prison's on lockdown and Mata Bosin has got a hard on for all the natives and all the Asian Islanders. He came, took everybody's TV, not everybody, but the natives' TV, the Asians' TV. They came, took all the properties from the homies, both Asians and native, and just pretty much dogged the homies out over this incident. Well, the homies over there, we understand that there's gonna be situations where shit like this is gonna happen. And being locked down isn't an issue. The issue they had was like, Damn, you say you were going to do this to this punk-ass CEO, get the whole compound locked down, get all our tables and TVs taken, all of our property taken from us. So now we got to, now the bros and the, other, and the Asian Islanders has got to pay the inflated prices to try to get commissary and stuff, you know, fish commissary and stuff through the door, buying it from other races. And, you know, we deal in commerce in a penitentiary. When something is hard to get, the price automatically goes up. So the dudes that run the store in the units know that the bros don't got no commissary. They don't got no coffee. So they're selling bags of coffee starting at, you know, from you, when you buy it from commissary, it's $4. When you buy it from the store band, it's gonna run you about six, $7. But because of the lockdown, they were charging the bros $20. And after like two or three months of lockdown, a bag of coffee was going for like $50. I don't know who the fuck would pay $50 for a bag of coffee, Keefe coffee at that. But, you know, people that got, you know, caffeine addiction or whatever, needs that coffee, need that fix. And before the lockdown was over, the coffee, a bag of $4 coffee was running due anywhere between 30 and $50. Now, where everybody was upset, including different races, including the blacks, the Mexicans, and everybody else was that, it's not that you went and jumped on the police and got us locked down, because you know, you're gonna do what you're gonna do. No one's gonna stop you from handling your business. But where they got upset was, the CEO came back to work the next day and they're like, damn, yeah, you, you put us all through this and you guys didn't even hurt the motherfucker, you know? So fast forward, when my cell was getting shipped out, you know, he ended up in the smooth program, leaving Atwater, he went to the smooth program. Then from the smooth program, he came to Florence, it was my celly. Well, when he caught the plane, going or coming to Florence, he ran to one of, the, one of the youngsters that popped it off. Now this youngster went to the system with seven years. And for whatever reason, you know, not for whatever reason, but he felt disrespected by the CEO and felt that he needed to handle his business. Well, handling his business on the CEO ended up costing him 20 years. He came to the feds with a seven year bid and when, uh, when my homeboy ran into him on the plane, the youngster was on his way to ADX with another 20 years on top of his seven years. You know, but this is why, you know, I say like these courage and his heart, this bought these nuts that these staff have that work in the facility are on loan by the federal government. Because 
if they're out in the world, if they run into me out in the world, they're not gonna talk to me greasy. They're not gonna be disrespectful to me because they know I'll bust their ass. But inside the penitentiary, they know if you put your hands on them, that they're protected and they're gonna be at the court testifying against you and trying to get you the maximum time possible. All these youngsters, you know, all the four or five that was involved, they all got broke off double digits, anywhere from 12 years to 20 years. And a youngster that jumped the whole thing off ended up getting 20 years added to his beef. And I say these stories because, you know, I, I share a lot of stories about inmate on inmate crime. You know, us being locked down, we're always at each other's throat. Like, I don't understand how they can't comprehend that we're not the enemies. We're all doing time together. We all been sentenced by the same court system and being kept locked up by these COs, by the government. Yeah, you're from a different gang. Yeah, you're from a race. But my beef is not with you. My beef is with the system that's got me housed here for the next two plus decades of my life. You know, a lot of my write-ups are things against the staff. Bucket in my cell, getting cell extracted, whatever. I'm, for the most part, I know where my beef is at. And I hate it to where another inmate makes it where I, I have to punish them. And I do it begrudgingly because I don't relish in the violence. I don't relish in trying to stab somebody or beat somebody up because whatever I can do to this individual, how I, you know, I can stab him, I can beat him up, it's just as easily can happen to me. I can go into a confrontation and I be, might be confident in my ability to defend myself or my ability to fight or handle you know, a knife or whatever. But that doesn't mean that it's all gravy, it's an easy road. This dude might know Kung Fu. This dude might be some martial art expert and whoop my ass in return. And the knife that I use on him could be taken from me and poke, and poke me with it. So I'm not in a rush to go punish somebody. But being in a penitentiary, you know, I tell homies that come in, like, this is the environment that you're in. What you need to do is draw a line. What is acceptable and what is not. If it's something that you can walk away from, walk away from it. If it's something you can mediate through a conversation, do your best to mediate it. But if something happens that you know you can't walk away from, that you know that it's gonna be, that because of this incident, because this dude did this, or because this dude said this, that the end result has to be this, that I advise them, get right to it. You know, because anything less than that, if you know at the end of the day, you're gonna have to punish this dude, and then you try to go to these people because you wanna be respectful to the car and the politics that are in place. Well, when you go to your people, for example, if somebody from another race, from another car, has issue with my homeboy and the situation is serious enough that I know that this dude is looking to punish my homeboy and he comes and tells me about it, I'm gonna give my homeboys a heads up. Yeah, we might resolve it on our own depending on the situation. We might punish the homie. We, pun we punish plenty of, the hom plenty of homies that jumped out there, that did things that they weren't supposed to do. But at the same time, the guy that's coming to me with the grievance is running a risk that I'm going to let my homie know. Because we all understand that we all know and everybody is guilty of it. When you have a good friend, somebody you care about, no one's perfect. They're going to fuck up here and there. It's just, it's just the nature of, of life. So... If I know somebody's threatening my homeboy's life because he fucked up over here, if I really care about this individual, I'm gonna be like, hey man, you got a pressing issue now. So there's only two things gonna happen. Either you go handle your business or we're gonna handle you. That's why 
for the most part, I try to follow protocol. I try to go through the change of command, you know, go through the spokesman, shot callers, whatever you want to call them with whatever issue I have. But, you know, throughout the course of my bid, I didn't have too many issues where I've never went and cried to another dude about somebody disrespecting me. If somebody disrespect me, he doesn't tell anybody about it, and I don't tell anybody about it, then nobody knows about it. I can move on and live my life. But if it's put in a way where I can't duck it, then I go handle my business. You know, I haven't gone through the yard without swallowing my pride here and there. You know, for me to even try to say that for anybody, I try to say that they went through the course of their 20 something year bid and never had to swallow their pride or never had to overlook a slight or a disrespect. I'm, they're lying to you. And if they're not lying to you, they're a better man than me. You know, I've been disrespected. I've been in, in a situation where I got the shit in the stick on a deal or whatever. But like I said, I drew a line when I came into the penitentiary. What I'm willing to kill somebody over. What I'm willing to stab somebody over. And if I'm not willing to stab somebody, because, you know, there's no such thing as just going to poke a couple holes in a dude. Because there's incidents where dudes get poked one time and die. While other incident, do get poked 20, 30 sometimes and live. So anybody, that's just same thing out here. You draw a line, what is acceptable to you and what's not. And keep to it. So you don't get yourself caught up in frivolous shit. This youngster, he interpreted what the CO said as calling him a bitch. Maybe the CO wanted to mean wanted it to mean that way. And well now he's gotta live with the fact that well hold on, let's skip this one. You know, maybe the CO did disrespect him. Maybe the CO did mean to call him a bitch. I wasn't there. But now he has to think about this whole situation for the next 20 plus years if that verbal disrespect was worth 20 years of his life. You know, when I knocked out the CO in the county jail, I'm going to be completely honest with you. That was not worth 96 months of my life. And I could have been home eight years earlier if I didn't let my pride get in the way. If I didn't let this motherfucking piece of shit antagonize me, get under my skin, and get me out of my character. Oh, no doubt it felt good for a split second. You know, it felt real good until that judge hit that gavel and said 96 months on top of my 18 years. And after I finished doing my 18 years for my bank robbery, every day, that shit played in my mind. Like I could have already been home, but I'm not because I let these piece of shit fucking CO get me out of my character. You know, if there's a moral to this, don't get put in that trick bag because you can't win. Welcome to the USP.